Good morning. Uh, this morning was an action-packed morning uh, because we had the baptism, and um, it's going to get even better because this topic is going to be relevant to all of you. Um, because um, I think after the uh, the love and the falling in love and the dating, then comes marriage. Oh, I don't mean to say it that way, but it is kind of that serious. Um, well, uh, I wanted to talk about marriage because it is one of the greatest schemes of Satan uh, in your life to steal, kill, and destroy you. Um, I would say if Satan had ten demons, he would put nine of them uh, to work on ruining marriages and maybe one on all these other things like causing grief. But I'm going to go through all of these and then we're going to pick up where we left off so that you have an, a good idea of all the schemes of Satan if you missed some of the previous weeks and all of the schemes of Satan that we go through actually also takes place in marriage, too. So that's why it's very important that we review. Uh, one of the schemes of Satan is, cause, is to cause you to have hurt and grief and disappointment in your life. And when you're a hurt person, you hurt people. And so how do we over overcome the schemes of Satan in this area? We go to Jesus. He's not only the healer of broken bodies, of cancer, of sickness. He heals our hearts. So um, if you missed that message, maybe look for it on YouTube, but go to Jesus. He will make you whole in your heart so that you can be a whole person. And then uh, the other scheme of Satan is to focus on you. So uh, through various different ways, different things, social media, um, the, the, the idea now is just all about you and how everyone sees you, either online or in person. Um, and the one way to overcome Satan's scheme about self-centeredness is practice being humble before God and before people. Take your eyes off yourself and focus on Jesus. And I'm so glad that uh, you guys made it uh, last night to the uh, first part of our uh, doing the, putting our hands to the kingdom work. Because I, I tell you, if you just put your hands to God's work, you're going to take your eyes off of yourself. And then your problems won't be as big as you think. Because you're not just like zeroing it on it all the time. So practice being humble. What does that mean? It means admit your sins to God when he shows you. Repent. Admit that, God, I did do that, and it's wrong, according to your word. And then repent. And then apologize to people. I tell you, there is no other most humbling thing is when you admit that you are wrong face-to-face -face with someone. You do that a couple of times, and you will get it, you'll start to get it right. Because uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, keep doing that. So practice being humble. And then the third one is the strongholds in your mind. Uh, what are these strongholds? Strongholds in your mind are when Satan put lies in your head ever since you were a little kid and then keeps confirming it, confirming it, and confirming it so that these lies become truth in your mind. Um, and most of these lies has to do with the value and the worth of you as a human being, that you must be like this, you must accomplish this, you must, um, you know, be uh, a certain way to be loved, to be accepted, when the truth is that you are loved, you are already accepted, and your identity is not what people say, it is what God says about you. So the one way to overcome that scheme is to know what God says about you, live what God says about you, and you won't be um, living uh, to please lies um, that Satan puts in your mind. And then the fourth one is um, uh, causing uh, offense uh, against people, which things are make them sad, things that make them mad, things that make them discouraged, disappointed. Um, uh, and Jesus Christ said, woe to the world, because it's things that cause people to stumble. Um, and it could be they're stumbling in their walk with Jesus Christ or stumble with each other and conflicts. Because Jesus Christ said it's better that you put a millstone around that person's neck and throw them into the sea rather than they face God's judgment um, one day for causing sin to happen in the world. And so Romans, Paul says that if possible, if you can do it, if there's any way 
Some things are out of our hands and we have no control over it. But if it is in your hand and you have some control over it, then as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We are peacemakers. And so that is who God is. He's a God of unity. Um, broken relationships come from Satan. So don't go there. Don't be a tool of Satan. Don't be an instrument of Satan to ruin people's lives and break up relationships. Be an ambassador of peace. That's who God is, and that's who we are as his children. So that's one uh, way to overcome Satan's scheme there. But now to the scheme of Satan's in marriage. And this is a prime time to share it with most of you because you're thinking about marriage, you're um, seeing people get married, you're seeing people date to get married because we date to get married, right? Not for fun. Um, but I had, uh, I had a very good example for the older folks, uh, but I, t I tell you, I tell you some of the ways that Satan kind of, uh, Satan misleads people into misunderstanding about marriage so that they don't think that it's not a big deal. Marriage is like, oh, something people do. People don't even get married now. The traditional way they just live with each other is not even necessary. Um, this is a cartoon of an ancient um, fighter in ancient China. And he says that um, brothers, so these are soldiers, you know, fighting with each other on the front lines. He said, brothers are like the arm and the leg. Your wife and your kids are like clothes you can put on and take off. Um, so right, right there, you can see that, oh, okay, yeah, brotherhood. And wife, chicks, no, no, okay. Um, so, uh, but then this person who wrote the cartoon said that when I was young, that's what, how I understood it. But when I got older, I understand that you can miss an arm and walk out in public, but you can't go out without your clothes on. You get it? <laughs> the older folks didn't get it either, but I just thought it was funny, but it shows how, you know, some people think about marriage just through um, common sayings, just through society, um, and so why I actually look on marriage.com are the different types. Did you know there's 25 different types of marriages? I don't think all of these are biblical, but let's go through some of them. The monogamous marriage, which is a typical man-woman type of marriage practiced all over the world. Then there is the polygamous marriage where one man may have two or three or more wives or one woman who could have two or three or more husbands. Same-sex marriages. I don't need to tell you about that. Maybe you can educate me on, on that. Um, and then convenience marriages. What is this? Convenience marriages, as the name suggests, is convenience uh, when two people get married for reasons that bring convenience to their lives, not because of love. They can, uh, these reasons can be practical or financial. Money, basically. All right. Zombie marriage. Did you know there's such thing as a zombie marriage? Zombie marriage is when you're both docile and nice to each other in front of other people. Um, and you're still married. However, behind closed doors, you do not share any sort of relationship. It's come to a point where you're not even sure you're both are really married in the essence of your relationship. That is a zombie marriage. That is actually marriage that actually occurs. Um, and then group marriage. I don't even want to go there. That's when, like, a bunch of people get married together. And then time-bound marriage. Time-bound marriage, I learned that there is such a thing practiced in Islam countries. This type of marriage is when the agreement of marriage is bound by time. The couple decides that they will only stay married to each other for a specific time, like two years or nine months or something. Well, anyways, I put those things there so that you see that in this world, Satan has put a lot of his time and effort to mess us up in our understanding and thinking about marriage. And even in Jesus' day, among the people of God, the Israelites, who had the word of God written by God's finger on these tablet of stones and Moses carried it down, they actually misunderstood marriage. Because when you hear the conversation, the Pharisees, which are the people who study the law of Moses for centuries, they memorized them. And they came and they asked Jesus, um, and they said, um, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? 
So evidently during that time, and Moses, um, what he taught them or what the law allowed them to do was you can actually divorce your wife if she couldn't cook ramen, okay? That is a reason, any and every reason. Um, so the Pharisees decided to ask Jesus, is it, is it really true that you can divorce your wife if she couldn't cook ramen? What if she couldn't cook eggs either? Um, but you can imagine that kind of conversation. And Jesus said, no. Jesus said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because you were weak, because you, were, you had a hardened heart. And so you can see that God's intention and what people are able to do were two different things. And Moses permitted them certain things because their heart was hard, hard, hard. Why? Their heart was hard against what God intended. But what did God intended originally in marriage? I'm not going to go through all the truths about marriage, but as you know, the way to defeat lies are with truth. So I'm just going to tell you three truths about marriage. There may be more, but I think these came to my mind while I was making uh, the lesson. So I'm going to share with you three truths about marriage. There may be others. There may be some more important, but these are, I think, pretty critical. First, Marriage is based on a covenant. A covenant is actually even stronger than a promise because all the covenants in the Bible, um, and I don't think, I don't know that this world outside of the Bible, the secular world has covenants. Um, they could be like um, twisted, perverted versions of the covenant in the Bible. But a covenant is stronger than a promise because it requires a blood of some sort to seal the covenant. When, uh, when Abraham made a covenant with God, he had to kill uh, some bulls and two doves, and he placed it on the altar, and the fire of God came down and burned it up, and God accepted the covenant. It was made between them. Um, and the covenant that God had with us that we are saved was uh, sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ who died for our sins on the cross. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, um, there would be no covenant. There would, no be, uh, would not be a promise of salvation and eternal life. Um, there would be none of that, no getting baptized, no, not, none of everything that we know about salvation without the blood of Jesus Christ. And then in marriage, it is actually sealed uh, is a covenant created by God in the Garden of Eden before the world uh, had sin, before sin entered the world, before things got really messed up. Um, God made marriage, and it is a covenant between one man and three women. Is that right? Oh, one woman. Yes. God created one man and one woman. He created them male and female. Uh, and he made and he established that covenant between so that two can become one. So if you know this truth, you will know that when you fall in love and you get married, what happens when you fall out of love? Yeah, are you married based on your feelings and how you feel that day when you woke up and looked at her in her eyes? No. No. If you know that a marriage is based on a covenant that is made between two people in front of God, then it's not based on your feelings. It's not based on how you feel about that person that one day or a couple of months. Um, it is based on what you promised before God with that person. So uh, marriage is based on a covenant, not on a feeling. The second one is, did you know that everything you hope to achieve in life if you are married, has to be achieved with your wife or your husband. So imagine God is the father, and he's really loaded. He is like super, super, super rich. Um, and he has uh, these children. And he left them a will. And in his will, he said that you can have the house, the car, the successful career, um, and the Bugatti, but to, in order to inherit it, it must be you and your wife or your wife and you. If there's only one of you, nobody gets anything. Nobody gets the inheritance. That is what 1 Peter um, chapter 2 says, that men um, treat your wife as the weaker vessel, 
Not weaker as in like weaker than you because you couldn't lift 500. Weaker as in more delicate. She's more delicate because she's created differently. Um, because the grace of life, if you want to inherit the grace of life, it must be inherited together. And if you don't have that unity, your prayer with God will be hindered. So right here, you see in the physical world, the car, the house, the business, everything will not flourish if you do not inherit it together in unity. And your spiritual relationship with God, your prayer life will be hindered if you don't have that unity with your wife. So it's not just a marriage, people. It's everything in your life is affected by this covenant and your relationship with your husband or your wife. That's why it's very important. And then the third one, uh, the truth about marriage is to raise godly children. In the Bible, God very clearly says that children come from where? Oh, a guy and a girl doing it? No. Um, that's not where babies come from, okay? Babies come from God. And it says in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, that children are the gift of God to um, a husband and a wife. That's why a guy and a girl doing it, you cannot guarantee that they're going to make a baby. If, if that was only the case, then people wouldn't have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to go to doctors to get in vitro. And every round of in vitro is like $10,000 just to have a baby. Babies just don't come. Babies are a gift from God. And so uh, God gave us children uh, when you're married to raise them up um, to be godly children, to know God, to love God, to live his good and perfect plan uh, for their lives. God loves children. Because how do we know that? Because first of all, God created us and he loves us and he calls us his children. Even the ones who don't know God, they're like the children who never knew who, or ran away from home, but God still calls them his children. And he's hoping like the, the father of the prodigal son that they will come home. And how else do we know when Jesus Christ came and he was an actual human being and spoke like we can understand, all the people were like Asian people. All the Jewish men were like, kids, get away from here. Um, go do something else. Else. That's what Asian people do. They won't even let like the kids sit at the dinner table with the adults. That's, that's like tradition. But Jesus Christ said, no, let the little children come to me. And he hugged them and he prayed for them and he blessed them. God loves children. And in that loving foundation of a united marriage, God gives people children to a brand new life with a world of opportunities to raise up to love God and to live that good life that God has for them. I'm touched because I have children and uh, I have so much hope for them um, because new life is beautiful. So these are just only three. There are more truths about marriage. Um, so I hope that you understand how important marriage is to God. And I want to conclude with this. If a whole nation was bad and it was like really, really wrong and they're ununited and they're divided. Um, what can God do? God can just take one family and he did. He called Abraham out from his country and started a brand new nation, the people of God. If a church was really messed up, like there's like a lot of offense, there's a lot of fighting and arguing within the church and the church is split up, what can God do? He can take one family from the church and start a brand new church that is united and loves God. But what happens when one family is destroyed? The children are destroyed. And that's why Satan spends so much time, so much effort, so much energy in destroying your families and the relationships that your parents have and the relationships that you will have with your husbands and wife. So know it and beware and do not fall for the schemes of Satan. So how do we overcome this, uh, Satan's uh, scheme in marriage? There's three truths, so I want to um, present three ways. 
um, and it's very simple, just like the three truths, covenant with a Christian. If marriage is a covenant that you make, then make that covenant with a Christian. Keep the unity in marriage because the, the foundation, the purpose of marriage is unity. And three, be knowledgeable about divorce. What you can think is an option, uh, when divorce is an option, and what the Bible says about it, and when the Bible says is not an option. So let's go through each one of these because I feel it's very important. Covenant with a Christian. So there's two things uh, to know here. You should decide in your heart right now that if they're not, not a believer, then it's not an option. That should just be like a non-starter for you. I'm not talking about if you see a nice girl or a nice guy at the OCCC and you want to invite them to go get coffee, go ahead, do it. Um, you know, uh, if you don't, then you're never going to meet so anyone because you don't know. Nobody wears like Christian on their forehead um, or I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, you have to get to know a person to know their faith and what they believe in. So I'm not talking about just asking someone to go to coffee or a date or to get to know them. But if you're in that part of your relationship, you've been dating for one or two years and you've met their parents, they've met your parents, you met their family, and it's looking like they are the one, but they're not a believer, then just say no. Uh, because if it's not a believer... Don't give yourself even 1% of an option uh, to start a family with them because, for this reason, um, because the, the maker and the keeper of the marriage covenant is God. If they don't respect the maker of the covenant, they don't know the maker of the covenant. If they don't answer to the maker of the covenant and the keeper of the covenant, you're going to have a problem when they decide not to keep the covenant. Um, so save yourself a lot, a lot, a lot of grief and heartache and just make the covenant with a Christian, a believer of Jesus Christ. Um, and um, I think I was going to say something else here. Um, oh, the other important part is don't make it a condition in your relationship. Don't tell them, if you're not going to be a Christian, I can't marry you because, you know, they're either going to dump you or they're going to come to church, get baptized, and be a uh, Christian. And that's not the kind of uh, Christian that you want. Um, so what you should do, and I, uh, you know, if you go out for the coffee and you've been dating and they're looking like they're the right one, and but they don't know about Jesus, they don't believe in Jesus, invite them to church. Invite them to church. Invite them to Bible study. Uh, let them let them learn. Let them know. Let them discover. And then let them come to their own conclusion about who this Jesus Christ is. And so that is is a natural because faith is personal. Everybody has to make their own decision to believe or not believe. The second thing about um, believers is if they believe. What do they believe? And I'm going to tell you there's a broad spectrum, okay? I'm not talking about other religions like Buddhism or Muslim or things like that. They, they believe in something completely different. I'm talking about religions who uh, carry around the Bible and they speak about um, God and they speak about Jesus. And I can tell you two very straightforward examples um, is Mormonism. Mormonism they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. Jehovah Witness, they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. And salvation, the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. Uh, Jehovah Witness believe, I think Jesus is a prophet. Mormons also believe that Jesus is a prophet and some other prophets like Joseph Smith. They also believe in very strange things that they don't really talk about, like all men are God and that no woman can go to heaven unless you're connected to a man, either through your father or through your husband, and some other strange things like polygamy. But they don't preach about that. So be careful. If they say they believe in Jesus Christ, ask yourself, ask them, what do they believe in? And then those are false religions, what I call false religions. And then they are people who really believe in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. But their, their religious background and their practices um, are what I call unacceptable. Um, and so these, you have to make the determination yourself. 
and you have to make the decisions yourself. And I say this, um, but it, it's only pertaining to some that I've seen in the Asian realm. Uh, a lot of uh, American Catholics, I don't see this, but Vietnamese Catholic who are very traditional, they have two practices that are unacceptable to us and the Bible. They worship idols and they pray to dead people. They pray to dead saints and they can rationalize it in several different ways, uh, but there's, uh, there's no way around praying to dead people and worshiping idols. Those things are very clear in the Bible that we should not do. And so if they believe, uh, what do they believe and how do they practice their belief? And even in like um, Protestant religions like Methodist, uh, Wesleyan, um, Baptist, uh, Protest, uh, like uh, Pentecostalism, um, those things you also have to think about because their religious background, their church organization, the music that they worship to may be different. And, you know, and you have to decide, okay, if we get married, which church are we going to go to? to the church you grew up, the church I grew up. So there's some things to think about there. Um, but the deal breaker is if they do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and is God. Um, if that is not, if that is, a, if they're not a believer of that, then tell yourself, decide in your heart right now, it's not an option. And then number two, keep the unity. And this is what I want you guys to really, really remember. The unity first and foremost is with God. And so uh, keep the unity with God. So when you're dating, when you're married, encourage your spouse to have a relationship with God. I'm not talking about nag them to death because then you would just annoy them. Um, but like uh, make time, get everything ready on Saturday so that you can go to church on Sunday. Um, encourage them to be active at church, encourage them to, uh, to, you know, go to Bible study, encourage their faith. Because if they are, if their relationship with God is strong, you're going to live an awesome life. You're going to have an awesome marriage. If their relationship with God is messed up, you can absolutely bet that your relationship with each other is going to be pretty messed up. It's true. So, Encourage their unity and their relationship with God first and foremost. Marriage is not just between two people. Marriage is actually a triune relationship, just like God, a trinity. It's Father, the God, uh, God the Father, um, the Son, and Jesus Christ, the man and the woman. You have to keep the unity, encourage and foster that unity with God. And then um, keep the unity with each other. Um, you know, there's going to be differences in like how you fold your towels and what day of the week you do your laundry. But ask yourself, does it really matter? And if it doesn't really matter, then keep the peace. Be united. Um, so uh, do everything you can that in your, uh, in your uh, strength um, that you're able to with it, when it depends on you to uh, keep the peace. And then three. Be knowledgeable about divorce. I'm going to go through three scenarios where the Bible permits divorce, and all other scenarios are not permitted by the Bible. So the first two, uh, three scenarios where the Bible actually permits divorce is in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul says that if a non-believer chooses to leave you, then let them go. In that, you're not bound by this covenant of marriage. Because uh, back then, in the first churches, they had some uh, problems in marriage, just like we do. And they asked Paul, and that was what Paul responded. He said that if people are not willing to maintain their marriage with you, if they're not willing to keep that covenant marriage with you, and they want to leave, let them leave. And it could be for any, any reason. Uh, a lot of the first believers, they believed in Jesus, and their wife or their husband didn't believe, and they didn't want to stay with them anymore. Um, and so he said, if they don't want to stay with you, just let them leave. You're not bound by the covenant marriage. Um, and then the second thing Paul says, this is the second scenario, right in those verses, Paul says that God wants you to live at peace. What does that mean? When there's violence in a marriage, that is a reason to leave. You may not proceed to divorce until that person gets help, but trust me, 
when there, uh, when there is violence involved, when there's physical abuse, when there are guns in the house, uh, when there's like, um, they're so drunk, they can't make rational decisions, and you have children in the home, it's time that you decide to live at peace. And you should separate yourself from that situation. Go, get help, get to a safe place. Um, that has, uh, that, that is a specific scenario that Paul talks about. Um, God wants you to live at peace. Because Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And so many women, so many children are actually killed in those types of relationships. Thinking that that person will get better, that person will stop. But without God, it won't. Um, and so uh, don't think that you can help that person by staying. Most of the time, you probably can't until they decide to change or get help. But you have to think about your safety and the safety of your children. That goes for both men and women. Uh, because I hear there are some women who beat their husbands too. Um, all right. And then the second thing. Oh, the third one, the third scenario that Jesus Christ said it is permissible to divorce are the verses that we just read. Um, and I'll read it again to you in Matthew chapter uh, 19. Jesus said that uh, they are no longer two, but one. And uh, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So they kept asking. Uh, Moses permitted it. And this is what Jesus said. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for, what is the exception? Except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Sexual immorality um, could be a couple different things, but most likely it is having an affair, cheating on the spouse. And in that situation, they have already broken the marriage covenant because the marriage covenant is made between how many people? Two people and God, all right? Um, and so um, if they have uh, committed adultery, if they have uh, gone outside the marriage, if they are having an affair, then that is the reason Jesus Christ permits a divorce because that marriage covenant has already been broken by the person who chose to have that affair. Now, it is permissible, but in that situation, it is up to you to decide um, that if you want to stay, if that person is willing to change and work it through, God heals marriages. He heals relationships. Um, that is something that we can believe in, uh, but both people have to be willing um, for, for that to work. Um, and so those are the three scenarios where the Bible permits. All other scenarios, the Bible does not permit. And so uh, it would be considered sin before God. And Jesus Christ gives us a very clear picture that Moses' law permitted. Just like now, to God, I think the two main uh, severe sins is murder and adultery. Those were specifically, and dishonoring your parents um, and coveting. Those were specifically mentioned in the Ten Commandments. You know, with murder, the law is like so strict. Like in Oklahoma, we have the death penalty. If you murder someone, first degree, you're going to get the death penalty. Divorce, oh, you know, you see those signs, $300 budget divorce um, with, without children. With children, it's going to cost you more. And then if the wife wants um, certain things or the husband wants certain things, then you got to get a lawyer. And the average divorce is eight grand, um, $8,000. And so you see the two difference. Murder, you go to jail for life where you get executed. Divorce, 300 bucks, and it's done. The court allows it. You go out before the judge, sign, done. You know, you see the difference. But if Jesus Christ gives this scenario, if you divorce your wife or divorce your husband, not because of those three reasons, and you get remarried, which is legal before the law, but before God's eyes, when you are living with that new spouse, you are committing adultery in front of God. That's how God views divorce is you are committing adultery. And in other places, Jesus Christ said that if you divorce your wife, if not for those reasons, then you are causing her to commit adultery when she gets remarried with another man because she's being united with someone outside 
of who God united you with. And so I hope you understand that's how God views marriage. And so uh, in conclusion, if you have fallen for Satan's schemes um, and you did not, oh, I didn't interpret this, but you did not value marriage um, and uh, you do not, um, you have not kept yourself uh, pure before you made that covenant, if um, you have already are married but uh, experienced some things that we talked about, then how do you overcome Satan's scheme? Or are you just going to be trapped in it and suffer the consequences? You don't have to be. Um, you can repent, and God will heal you, and he will heal the marriage that you're in, um, and he will heal your family. So I want everyone to stand up and close your eyes. And many of you have not been married, so a lot of these situations will not pertain to you. But close your eyes, and I'll go through each scenario so that if it does pertain to you, you can um, take this opportunity and repent before God. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Um, I'm just going to go through the scenarios and which one that God shows you. You come to him and you repent. So close your eyes um, as we place us something. Um, so if you are already divorced and are remarried and your marriage now is fine, but if today you are reminded that what you did during that divorce leaving the one that God joined you to was a sin, then repent today if you haven't already. If you have divorced someone, repent now. Say, Jesus, please forgive me because I didn't know your will for marriage. If you're married and you have left or considering leaving your spouse. I'm not talking about when you're the one being left, but if you're at, re at fault, then repent now and reconcile, make peace with your spouse, your husband or your wife right now. If you're not married, but you've bought into all these things that you heard about marriage and you yourself come to the understanding this morning that you didn't respect marriage. You didn't respect what God wanted you to do with your bodies, with your heart, in preparation for marriage. Then repent now. Say, Jesus, please forgive me for not respecting and honoring marriage like the valuable thing that you created it to be. And I'm going to come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for through marriage that you established. We have everything that we experience in this world, families, churches, societies, people, community, God. We thank you so much for letting us experience unconditional, united love, God. And I bless everyone here that is single, that is young, that is dating, God, that you lead them forth in your truth, God, into marriage, um, into a covenant marriage with people who love you and honor you. Um, and I bless them with unity, God. I bless all the future marriages and the current marriages right now. I bless them with the unity that only you can provide, God, the unity of you yourself, that you are one so that we may be one, God, um, so that we can uh, bring forth um, children, God, and raise them up to love you, to honor you, to be united with you, just as we are united with you and with each other, God. God, we thank you so much for all that you have given. And right now, um, we speak to all the devil's schemes. And in the name of Jesus, we break off every stronghold 
um, to destroy relationships within this church, to destroy families, to destroy marriages, uh, demons of broken relationships, we command you to leave. Um, uh, demons of the assignments to break up families and marriages, we cancel your assignment and we command you to leave. All guilt, all shame, we command you to leave. We live in the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. All pain and bitterness and grief, we command all of you to leave in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask that you pour the love of God into our hearts right now and make us whole and lead us forth um, as whole people, God, that you created us to be in our lives, God, to start new beginnings and new families with those that you have prepared um, for them, God. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's sing. Praise the Father. Praise the May the love of God, the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we see you again face to face. Amen. All right. And those who were baptized, please come on up and get your uh, certificate of baptism. Next Saturday will be the younger group, Max Life. And I will also send out um, a, a volunteer link if you want to volunteer for this year's Unite OKC concert at Scissor Tell Park. Um, so Julia, John, um, Jason, Menduk, Se uh, Unite OKC is September 8. Um, those who want group picks, come on up. Um, John.